you'd mentioned in your notes that if you were a character from a movie or a book, you would be Ellie Woods. I don't know who Elle that Woods. is. Elle Woods. And, Elle Woods, pardon me. <laughs> Elle Woods, Samwise Gamgee. So who are those characters? <laughs> Obviously, I know Sam, but who are those characters and why would you pick them as to define you? Elle Woods is um, Reese Witherspoon's character in the beloved uh, early 2000s girly movie um, Legally Blonde. Um, about, uh, about the sorority girl who ends up going to law school to like, uh, get the boyfriend back who dumped her. But the reason I say I'm that character with the mixture of that and Samwise Gamgee is that, um, I wish I could add like a third character. Cause I, I would have to think of like a really, like a nerdy one who's really into like theology debates and stuff, but <laughs> like, I'm that person. I, I'll be like young Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> well, yeah, not quite that, like a dumber version. Um, I was, you know, I'm the kind of person I'll be like listening to like a Trent Horn debate, you know, Catholic answers debate while like putting like individual rhinestones on like a, a tumbler, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I'm very, mm-hmm. I'm very girly. I'm really into like pink and super, super Elwood's girly. But then, you know, I have that other side and, uh, Samwise Gamgee is like my moral hero in fiction, I would say. I love yeah. I love just the idea of a simple life and of valuing like home, family, good food, simple living, not having to be the richest or the best or the smartest person. So That's awesome. I I think a lot of us love Sam and I think Tolkien intended for him to be the heart of the whole story. Like he's the character, the reason why everybody does everything. Even Frodo's for the guard i'll start crying I love- <laughs> yeah. oh i love i love Ooh. that movie okay well hey welcome everybody today we are joined by stephanie Luzinski. she is a wife mother and a catholic convert who writes christian fantasy books welcome stephanie good to have you thank with you us. so much for having me so we're going to chat about stephanie's backstory her, her origin story and she's got her first novel is out storm and spire and it's book one of the magnify actually reverse reverse magnify is the Pardon first me. book and then storm and spire is a series i do have it kind of weird on the cover so <laughs> don't blame me there okay no worries we'll talk all about that so uh catholic author it is the show about fiction for modern catholic authors we're talking creed craft and co-creation rooted in grit grace gods and dragons and in this show we actually get to talk about dragons which is awesome i'm your host dominic de souza novel lover all-around creative founder of catholic author we're here to inspire your faith and your fiction stephanie i'd love to dive into your origin story and let's learn more about you when did you when did you start writing Oh my goodness. Um, I think I've always been writing. It's really common with authors, I think, that we just get started. I was actually homeschooled, so I was very fortunate to have a lot of time to dedicate to that. My math and stuff is not great, but at least I really, you know, my parents really supported my dreams of writing and I got to, I just spent so much time as a kid reading. Um, yeah, I was, I was probably writing stories like before I was like, you know, I was 10, <laughs> but um, it took me a while, I guess, to kind of get into being more serious about it. I think I completed my first like really crappy novel when I was like 20 or something like that and I'm 30 now so it's been it's been a little while to actually get serious but yeah all my life that is awesome what um what were some of the early topics that interested you when you were oh my goodness um I I write fantasy now and I guess I've always been drawn to fantasy um yeah just the the kind of like universal stuff is my favorite just redemption and I really like character driven stories where you take a character and you see their flaws and you see them finally overcome it and be the person that they're meant to be. And I think that's just a universal thing. I think that's, it's a God thing. You know, it's a thing that we all recognize and all love. So I've tried all kinds of different stuff. I wrote a romance novel a couple years ago because I was like, maybe this would be easier. Like, I love the business side of self-publishing. I'm sure we'll get into that. Like, maybe I could do that. Like, right. Like a, you know, like a nice clean romance novel. And turns out it's really hard. Like, I, (laughs) I don't know if I could give readers what they want in that area. So yeah, then and now I think I always keep coming back to fantasy. Like there's something about getting to create new worlds that I just absolutely love. And I actually read a lot of mystery and thriller (laughs) when it comes to writing. Like I have never really got the urge to be like, I'm going to write like an FBI detective novel. Like it's just just too, it's just, it's too complicated. I'm not sure it's for me. Oh, that's, that's fun. How, um, so you've actually written a couple of novels. Like you just tried one for the heck of it. (laughs) I've done a few. Um, I think it takes the pressure off. I think when you just, I kind of look at it as like, this is a practice book. This doesn't have to be, you Mm. know, this is actually something that's really 
I don't know, just kind of kind of a thought I've had that's really been crystallizing over the last couple of years is just my kind of philosophy of how I want to go about be actually becoming an author. And a part of that for me was realizing that, look, this, this first book, I love my first book that I published. I love Magnify. I love the characters, love the series that I'm working on. But mm-hmm. I, it doesn't have to be like something that I've poured my heart and soul and, you know, all my artistic talent into yeah. for 10 years. It, it really doesn't. Uh-huh. And I don't think and I don't say that just to be like, oh, I'll just put out crap and eventually I'll get better and make people pay for it. And of course not. But I think that a lot of authors, it's very easy to get caught up in this. Like, you you know, people work on their first novel for like 20 years, <laughs> you know, and then eventually it gets yeah. easier. And for me, I was kind of just like, you know, I wrote a couple and you know, and there were just various problems where I would, you know, I, I do the draft and I write pretty clean drafts, but even so, you know, I finish it and be like, Oh my word, like editing, this is going to be hell on earth. <laughs> like I, there's problems that are so catastrophic. Like I don't know how to fix this or things that just didn't feel like it was the one. And when I finished mm-hmm. this, this story, um, I just remember saying to my husband, like, this is the one, not like the one that's going to make me the next like millionaire author or anything, but the one that's, that I'm proud of that represents me where I am right now. It's the best product that I can make right now that I think readers are going to really love. And so, yeah, I just, I think I've written how many books are, I don't know, like probably like five or six. Yeah, maybe something like that. But yeah, this is the first one that's actually ever going to be allowed to be read by anybody in the public. So (laughs) that is awesome. Good for you. (laughs) And you've already started diving into the next one. Yes. Um, already. Yeah, we're, we're in, I'm, um, I'm working on plotting this next one right now because uh, that's another thing that used to used to happen to me. Like I would do a lot of like pantsing, right? We just write by the seat of your pants and I just like dive in. And of course that gets really hard. Like later in the book, you're like, uh oh, <laughs> I've dug myself in all these corners. Like how do I tunnel my way out? So I'm actually really impatient. The, the next book, um, next book, I actually haven't revealed the title yet. So show exclusive. Okay. It's going to be called Majesty. Is the second book in the Storm and Spire oh, wow. series and. Um, I've got it like, I would say at least half of it plotted. Um, so I really am eager to start actually drafting. I'm like super impatient. I'm like ready to go. But I know for me personally, I think everyone finds their thing. But for me, when I actually take a little more time in the plotting stage to like, ask myself those questions, like, Oh, what if this thing did this? Like, if I take that time now, I find that I draft a lot faster. And I'm already fairly, fairly quick. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually hoping to have book two out this fall. I haven't said like a firm that's date awesome. yet, but, but that's, that's what we're, yeah. that's what we're going with for now. That's awesome. So it's like, what, it takes you about three months to write a novel? Um, I would, so Magnify took me, I think I started like plotting it like maybe in January. I think I started drafting it around February and then it took me, yes, I think it takes me on average. Awesome. Again, I've written a few books. It wasn't my first book that was this kind of pace. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say anywhere from I, that book took me about, I would say eight weeks ish to draft, which were kind of split up. Like there was a couple of weeks that were like a nightmare that just nothing got done in there. But this book I think will be a little longer. So I'm going to hopefully I'm thinking like three months will be great. And hopefully I can come in like under that time and then editing and all that nice. stuff. But yeah. Well, that's awesome. So what is the, um, uh, let's outline your first book, Magnify. What is Storm and Spire about? What's it about? about? That's like the worst. You know, I had a, I met a lady on the street yesterday. It was like lovely woman, probably in her 60s. And I just randomly talking to her at the little free library, like the little box where the books are. And she overheard me uh, talking about a book and was like laughing at something I said to my six-year-old. Um, so I started chatting with her and she's just like, oh, what's your book about? And I'm just standing there on the street like, oh no, I have to elevator pick this book for like teenage <laughs> girls to this <laughs> lovely like older lady like I'm gonna sound ridiculous but I'll I'll try my best so yeah so Magnify is well the whole series I guess kind of has a similar kind of premise right because it's a series of course it's about a 17 year old boy named Wes who is he's kind of a he's a chosen one but a kind of a reluctant chosen one Um, ever since his birth his role is to be the envoy which basically the task of the envoy is to bring the monetary sacrifices of the people to the Draco Dei or the dragon gods for thus Latin, <laughs> the Catholics all know <laughs> what I'm referring to, but, um, and he kind of starts to suspect that they're not holding up their end of the deal. So basically, um, 
it's kind of like, you know, they're offering sacrifices in exchange for protection from all of the perils that surround the people in their world. And he starts to have doubts about this, that, you know, are they holding up their end of the deal? And then he meets a misunderstood dragon who is having similar doubts herself. And she kind of offers him a choice that's different than what was planned for him. So that's, that's the basic core idea. Yeah. yeah, I remember I read, um, I got about halfway through the book oh, so okay. far and <laughs> the, the first, yeah, the first couple of chapters just, I'm a, such a sucker for mystery novels, you know, and Me too. <laughs> uh, I loved how you actually set that up, you know, uh, really well, really intriguing. Oh, thank you. Just thank the premise you so much. was just really, really cool. Um, what was, what is it like writing a dragon character alongside a cast of human characters? Did you end up... How did that sort of in, in, it make you think about that, well, the characterization and how to yeah, write well, them? I mean, you've probably read other dragon novels like, I don't know, Aragon. I was going to say, dragon I read Aragon as like a teenager, you know, like it's been years since I've read that book and I don't remember it being like the best uh -huh. written thing ever or anything. I don't, I don't know. I haven't read it in a long time. <laughs> Um, but I remember being just fascinated with that idea as I just think it adds a bit of different, but it's also, it's, it's kind of insane in a way to do it because it, it is really hard to write characters like this. And then you have to think about like, how do they communicate and like how to avoid like really awkward scenes where like she picked up something with her hand, you know, it's, <laughs> I've had to kind of figure that out, but. Well, she's also an yeah, archivist, yeah. you know, so she's like crushing yeah, herself in like between these, these shelves underground and I love and the reading bookish books and dragon tropes. So <laughs> I think it just, I had to do that. I think that's a total other thing, by the way, that I feel about, about writing that was holding me back for so long. I was like trying to do these, like, I want to be so unique and different than anything that's ever been written. And I think finally I, I've gotten much older and kind of realized, like, I don't have to be too cool for everything, you know? Like, I can write a book that has a, a bookish dragon if I want to, and I can put my own spin on it and, you know, put it in a new world. And yeah, I love Cell Series character. I love... I love getting to explore her motivations and how different she feels from every, basically the rest of the main cast, which is getting expanded for book two, by the way. So <laughs> another reason it's going to be long, right. but yeah, cool. it's really interesting to do. You mentioned that um, uh, you love to take characters and uh, j just dig into them and really explore them. So is that primarily your writing style? I mean, it's sort of pantsing when you can get away <laughs> with it, but does it start or it centers around, I love this character and I want to see, let's go on an adventure with them. Or is it more, here's a really cool idea. Let's throw some characters in it and see where That's it interesting because I think those are, that kind of represents the two ways that you start a book, right? Like, I think that's like, whether you plot it out beforehand or you just go by the seat of your pants, I think that's there. Those are the kind of ways to look at it. And I would kind of put those into, there's two very popular writing craft books. One is called Take Off Your Pants by Libby Hawker. I hate the title. <laughs> But I recommend it to okay. all of your listeners who write books because it's just it was it's been like life changing for me as a writer. And then there's the Save the Cat Writes a Novel, and that's that's a book that yep. really I think a lot of people would recognize. It's it's very much based on a, a very famous screenwriting book, and that book I think I would say is very plot focused. It's very much about like here's what mm -hmm. needs to happen here, and then it's going to be cool, and then the bad guy's going to turn and do that. And I think it's it's like very cool. Like I I think that the it it can really help you if you have like a sagging, boring middle of your story or something like that. But I really like about Libby Hawker's take off your pants method because her thing starts with a character and their flaw and what they want. And, okay. and I've just found the way that's how I think about stories. I, I, I'm honestly struggling to remember the kind of genesis of Magnify, um, but it, it started with Wes. I, I know that much. It started with Wes and I kind of had this thought like, how can I, like, I would say my book has a lot of more it's it's very gently allegorical in a lot of ways like it's it's i've kind of gone between like do i market this as christian fiction do i market this as not christian fiction and kind of been in between but i would say that it started with this idea of how can i have this character who basically exemplifies the kind of sacrifices of the old testament but in a very different way where you're not going to immediately mm. recognize it. and obviously the world grew from there and it got farther afield uh, but a I little bit yeah now. it's subtle yeah. <laughs> it's subtle intriguing that was like way off topic. I'm sorry. I said I, I'm very Greek and I can get very into the <laughs> into these discussions. Many rabbit holes. No, that's fine. We <laughs> love rabbit holes. I'm a complete nut for rabbit holes, which is very dangerous. Um, yeah, because I get lost all the time. Forget my questions. <laughs> um, case in point. So let me see. Let's let's say something intelligent now. It'll come to you. Um, so 
when so when okay so you started with a character <clears throat> excuse me and then uh built it out into this oh, you know what actually i want to go back and ask you more about that <laughs> that book take off your okay. pants and, <laughs> oh, what i've just finished reading save really? the cat Writes i just novel. finished it I've just and i've read, read it, yeah. save the cat okay and it's just amazing and i'm actually i'm i'm terrified to say this out loud but it, i am slowly working oh, on my okay. own novel it's been like 10 years and stuff and it's really cool to actually use that and kind of hit the beats that they recommend um but now i'm really intrigued to hear more about this other approach and the fact that it worked for you can you unpack it a bit more it's like you said start with a character and a flaw and so i wish i had the book in front of me because of course i'm like i'm not remembering all the details she does go into the she does go into the plot stuff as well and it, i would say it actually her kind of as you go further through her kind of process, it does follow like very neatly mm -hmm. with the famous save the cat beat sheet. So I think that they're not like opposite. It's just that it's a slightly different emphasis. And I struggle with plotting like, Oh, this is when to do this next. This does this next. Like it has to come to me organically, I think. And I think that, yeah. So I would say you kind of start with, you start with a character and then you think about their flaw. Then she directs you to think about the mm -hmm. end and not the end of the plot. She actually really say, really, really gets across in the book something that I didn't understand, which is that the plot is actually the most kind of movable part of your book. Like you can have, you as long as you know your character really well and your character arc really well, you can mess around with the plot so much and still end up with that core story that's really compelling. And that was like a breakthrough for me. I was like, oh, oh like the, I, I it, okay. it made me feel less intimidated by like the I, what I would call like the blow by blow of the plot. Like he goes here and then talks to a dragon and does oh this. God. And yeah, so you really you touch on the the end and what she means by the end of the book is did the char did this character achieve their did they achieve their external goal? And what happened with their internal kind of goal? And, you know, sometimes that the lesson that yeah. they want to learn isn't what they actually need to learn. What they actually need to learn is something that they don't even recognize at the beginning of the story. So, yeah, it's a short read. And um, it's actually, I actually bought the ebook, read it so many times, like poking around on my Kindle, super annoying. So I went and got the paperback. But yeah, it's, it's very, it's an inexpensive, like 150 page book. And I highly recommend it to anybody who writes books. Brilliant. Yeah, I think I'm going to check it. that out. Um, that's so intriguing to sort of detach the, the need to, uh, that's actually curious. I'm actually kind of wondering if my own writing style is a little more like that. And I, I like, I feel like just to know enough about where to go so that I can keep writing. Yes. Um, but if I'm like, I've seen some authors who are like, spreadsheets we're spending five <laughs> oh, pages no, I can't here do that either. and here's the color coded. No, I do color. I'll, I'll look at like, uh, <laughs> okay. I'm not even that organized. Um, uh, it's like I'll look at some of these author writing softwares Scrivener, and they're yeah. like, and here you can break everything down. And I'm like, that's hard. <laughs> I would love to be that organized, but um, I think I'm actually more of a pantser than I admit. So, um, so what is it like for you then writing one story and then crafting, you know, a uh, satisfying ending, which I haven't yet read. <laughs> we'll hope so, it's satisfying, yeah. And then opening it up again into... I imagine it's a trilogy. Um, or a I was series, originally anyway. thinking a trilogy. Now I'm like, will it be four books? I'm really, I, I think I'll have a better idea after book two because that's where I'm going to see where these kind of middle okay. subplots, like how much words they take, and and we'll get to this. I'm hoping, but mm -hmm. in self publishing, you know, you don't necessarily want to be like it's not financially viable to be. It, in my opinion, you're better off having two slightly shorter books when you're selling them for such a low price than it is to have this like hundred and fifty thousand word monstrosity of a book. So if it starts feeling that right. way in book two, I'm like, I'm going to try and you know. Know, twerk around with the arc a little bit to make sure that it kind of makes sense as like four books but that I'm not actually sure yet but um, I'm actually I'm really learning that as I go because I've written like a few novels but I've never written a series before I've started series and I've it's it's difficult because a lot of the advice for single books I find there's all this advice out there and then when it comes to writing a series it's like oh just you know make sure there's a satisfying mm -hmm. arc to each story and I'm like okay but how <laughs> but I actually yeah. think that um I think that it's coming together. I think the key thing is just knowing what, what to leave beneath the surface and what to put in. So for me, how that's kind of worked out is I'm not as crazy organized as some of these people, but I do use the Scrivener software because I have all of these kind of, I have like a, a section in there called history and timeline where I basically have the, like the key events of my world, my story's world. So I have that all laid out. Then I have some of these mm -hmm. kind of background 
subplots about these characters that I know, but the reader doesn't know. So there's all of these things to explore. And, you know, again, I kind of just looked mm -hmm. at that, that kind of idea of my core characters. And I thought, where do I want them to be at the end of the series? So I think as long as I know that and I have that in mind, even if I change some of the plot things, I think that it's going to it's going to work out fine. And so far, book two is going fine. And I'm hoping I think book two is going to be harder in a way because it's obviously harder to end a story in the middle than at the beginning where you're kind of just like, and now we get on to the rest of the story. But yeah, we'll we'll see. <laughs> we'll yeah. see how well I do with that. But So the reason why I ask is because I'm the novel that I'm writing is also intended to be um, a trilogy. <laughs> uh, so that same kind of question, like what makes a satisfying ending? How much do I reveal or talk about in the third novel? Uh, sorry, the first versus the third, um, kind of like that save the cat, you know, they'll talk about, well, your whole trilogy needs to have the three beat points. And book one is, is kind of the first act of the whole thing. And it's like, it's a lot of pieces to, yes. to be considering. So, um, I think you'd mentioned in Scrivener, you've got a bunch area of area where you, all of that good stuff. Uh, one, what is that like for you? How much do you go into it? How much do you end up putting in the actual story? Um, I think that I go as deep as I can where without wasting time, I would, I would say like, I think that, um, because I know it's definitely possible to do so much world building that by the time you get to the book, you're kind of bored because you just spend all this time writing these, like, you know, most people are not able to pull off like Tolkien level world building. <laughs> and I'm definitely no exception. Like, Hey, I, I don't uh, seek to go to that level of depth. However, I think that having robust kind of ideas in your own mind of how things work, it does really help you because it kind of solves some of your plot problems before they happen because you kind of know, okay, I've already established in my, you know, books world. And my husband actually has a way better memory than I do for these things. So I'd be asking him, I'm like, did I say this in the story or was this just like an invention in my own head? Um, but yeah, if you can avoid doing that, I think that a lot of, especially beginner authors, I think a lot of us have a tendency to put in too much rather than too little. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I'll read books and I'm just like, I don't care about this yet. Like I don't, I'm not right. engaged enough yeah. to really know. And I think again, the whole, our, we kind of, I just think culturally have this idea that everything has to be unique and super different. And I think when you read a book, I, that was some of the best advice I've ever heard about reading fantasy. I wish I could condense it into the, you know, very intelligent way that I heard it. But basically the idea is you want to start your readers off with what is familiar. You don't want to start them with all the really unique stuff. You want to kind of start with, like, if your book has all these crazy creature, mythical creatures and nonsense like my book has, um, you it, it it's a little easier when it's something like dragons and dwarves because people kind of know that. But if you're going to do, like, you know, a unicorn slash phoenix thing called a gazarkin or whatever, you know, you need, to, you need to ease people in. If you put that on page one, most people are just going to be bored because they don't, they're not invested. So I... Mm -hmm. I tried to do that with Magnify. I tried to be like, okay, I'm very interested in all this history of the world, but you know, you you never want to have like a scene where it's like, as you know, Bob, you know, back in the glorious <laughs> history of, you know, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it can be boring. So yeah, that's world mm -hmm. building is I'm minimalist in the book. I will say, I will say that I, mm -hmm. I try to have their, you know, iceberg <laughs> keep like the 10% in and the rest is below the surface kind of coloring the world as I write the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. There's a, um, I just burned through a novel uh, in two days nice. that I just discovered on Kindle. And the author was, uh, he's building this incredible world of magic and stuff like that. But there was almost zero world building, you know, or, or info dumping in the first novel. It was all just story, <laughs> story, just pulling you through the characters. And he's just opening all these loops in your head, like, what if, what if, so what, if? what <laughs> happened there's like a little hint as they're going through oh, ruins so and stuff and then then you get to the end and you're like and he's he doesn't have a sequel out yet and i'm dying but so there's all these open loops you know and it's like now i'm ready for the info dumping okay you've yes. now earned the right yeah. to dump stuff. yeah that's awesome and it's like it's it's hard to do it's hard to pull off because i think so it's you know because mm -hmm. you you have to have think time for things slow down a little bit especially in, in genres yeah. like fantasy readers do ex like you have to know your reader expectations i think you know in like a yeah. spy thriller and a guy with a gun and you know it's like nobody's expecting you to describe <laughs> describe anything you know yeah, the kremlin politics and yeah exactly like, nobody cares yeah, right? we get cold war stuff <laughs> exactly where fantasy like i think readers like that that world that gripping world but i think it's true i think if you can get your readers through your book one they're gonna be a lot more patient with your nonsense in book two when it comes time to be like you know yeah. to kind of dig deeper and i yeah it makes it interesting it's like a payoff of questions they're asking well exactly 
And also, even if you're not doing like, you know, a series, you're just doing the one book, um, this is not a hard and fast rule. This is my suspicion that the kind of world building information stuff would make sense to come a lot later, like after the 60% point, maybe. I mean, if you have to give it, then give it. Yes. But it's like, at what point in our own lives do we ever slow down and read a manual? It's like, woohoo, it's a race car. Everybody in. Okay, I shotgun. Uh, and then it breaks down like a mile later and like, okay, let's pull up the Wikipedia for this thing and actually do some of our homework. And I think a lot of, um, at that point, you're kind of invested in making this thing going, you know, where the characters are, you know, what the stakes are, the motivation, you know. Uh, and at that point, then it's like, now let's, now let's slow down and, and dig into the details a little bit more. No, I like that analogy. I've, I've never thought of it that way, but that's absolutely correct. And it's true. There, there can be a danger of going too far the other direction. I've definitely read books where there's so little world building that I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, who is this yeah, guy? Yeah, I'm sorry. Down. Hold on. <laughs> and I, I personally am, I love fantasy, but I will readily admit some of the more very long, very in-depth fantasy, I sometimes don't pick up that often because I just especially with little kids interrupting every five seconds, you know, sometimes I, I, I don't yeah. have the mental energy to read a thousand page book, especially one where I have mm -hmm. to remember like, you know, who someone's mother's sister's step daughter is from the whatever kingdom. It's yeah. just the amount of names and information and things. So yeah, you mm -hmm. really have to find the balance. Cause if you just throw too much at people and don't explain anything, yeah, it's like you, you mm -hmm. don't want to be dumbing things down for your readers, but you also yeah. don't want to assume that they remember everything as well as you do. There was a couple points yep. in the book. Um, where my husband was like, wait, did you talk about this earlier? Like, I don't remember this at all. And I'm like, yeah, I did. And like page five, but you know, I don't blame you for forgetting, you know, 200 pages later. So yeah. It's funny you mentioned that I was, I think we, as we watch um, like sometimes TV shows or blockbuster shows or whatever movies, how many times they will repeat a piece of information because they're going to assume that you're going to forget. And it's kind of like whitewashing. So we're going to come back and sort of yeah. do it again, <laughs> paint it again. It's like in every episode, the characters kind of, it gets, in, if you're watching, like my wife and I watched Smallville. Um, oh, I remember that show. We Goodness. watched Smallville recently. <laughs> and the number of times where they just simply stand up and just repeat exactly the same piece of information, you know, we already He's know. Superman. Well, yeah. it's because it was supposed to be a week later, you know, and you've forgotten. But even in a movie, they will keep, they don't assume that you remember. And uh, they will have you restate the character's motivation it's almost like every time there's a new character it's not you know, a sub character who comes in it's like this is an opportunity to move the plot along but also an opportunity for the main hero to restate to this person and by proxy the audience um or the readers this is what's important and this is why we're all here and stuff like that um it's just one interesting little sort of trick that they they do a lot. Yeah, and I think that today we're seeing a lot of authors who are kind of drawing from the screenwriting industry because I think that that's especially in our fast-paced world for better or for worse, people's attention spans aren't as good. Like they're, you know, uh, Charles Dickens was a popular novelist. So, you know, I think today's, you know, most of us are that's difficult <laughs> difficult to read, right? Cuz we're a lot dumber and, you know, less attention span, but I think that yeah, when you write, you can really utilize some of those things. You have to do it like don't be so heavy-handed. Like I've read books where I'm like, "Yes, I know the guy is whatever." Like I've heard this so many times. Like mm -hmm. yeah, it's a balance, but I do think that you have to um another thing from my beloved Libby Hawker book. This whole show is just me promoting <laughs> Hawker's book instead of my own. If you got an affiliate <laughs> link, you can mention it at the end. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, but she mentions a lot about how books should have a theme and that you can, mm -hmm. when your scenes should, you know, bear upon the character's arc or the theme of the story or both. Um, and I think that's very true. And she's saying, like, you know, it's not just like these like heavy themes, like it doesn't have to be some sermon type theme, but it can be something simple. Like, I would say the core theme of the whole Storm and Spire mm -hmm. series is sacrifice is love and love is sacrifice. That's a big theme throughout, I should say, mm -hmm. most of the characters and throughout the kind of broader world. Um, you know, to varying degrees mm -hmm. in each installment, I'm sure. But, um, and yeah, you can kind of yeah. remember, you know, remind readers of that. Like, what is the point of what I'm, what I'm writing for you? What is the point of mm -hmm. what this character is trying to learn? And you could, I think you can do it in a subtle way where it just keeps people, because right. then when they, you know, life's busy, I'll read a book and sometimes it'll take me two days. Sometimes it'll take me weeks because life's getting in the way. And it's nice to go back and be like, okay, this is reorienting me in the world. Yeah. I have to say, I like that about the, that one point from Save the Cat writes a novel where they're like in, I think it's like beat three or early, early scenes. Somebody has to literally stand up and tell oh. the, 
well, not just save the cat, but tell the right. protagonist, the main character. Theme stated, uh, yeah. <laughs> insert theme for, yeah, state the theme for the novel. It's like, you know, if, if, if you don't cut that out, you're going to break your neck, you know, or I don't know, if you don't change your life, you're never going to get, you know, marry anybody or I don't know. And of course, at that point, the character is in, in no place to listen. You know, it's like, like Tony Stark, you know, if you don't stop this, you're going to destroy the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know? That's so true. Yeah. And it. It's and then you, it's only like when you rewatch it afterwards you realize you know in uh, in some ways Marvel is like really good at just kind of slipping them in there sometimes it's in the middle of a conversation and then you come back and you're like <laughs> that's what oh, they were doing they're the reading that save the cat aren't they <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly I don't know if I did anything I, quite so explicit but I think there's a couple points where I'm like I, yeah that's that's kind of a theme stated moment because <laughs> I think we naturally mm -hmm. do it right to a degree yeah no that's that's very cool. Um, I'm curious, growing up, did you have a favorite legend or a, a favorite story that you love to, to read or to think about and you'd come back yeah, to a lot? Favorite legend? Up? I mean, I guess I'm not counting The Lord of the Rings as a legend. <laughs> feels feels rather... It can count. It is an easy choice, <laughs> feels though. Very, yeah, I know. It's such an easy choice. And I think, I mean, there's a reason for that. But no, I would say I think that there's a lot of like stories from the Gospels really spoke to me, even though I, you know, largely left the faith until I was, I'm mean, not that they're legends, but, you know, those kind of, those core... Mm -hmm kind of stories that really speak to speak to the heart like I was like very fascinated and still am to this day by like the just the passion narrative there's so much drama and emotion that like I'm like yeah. wow this is more incredible than <laughs> than any than mm -hmm. any fiction and I did really love just like some of those really classic fairy tales the ones you see turned into Disney films you know like uh mm -hmm. really loved Beauty and the Beast so that, <laughs> that's definitely my yes. favorite yeah, and there's these stories that yeah. now it's like very very popular thing to do like retellings, and I'm like I love that that that's mm -hmm. a thing <laughs> that's a thing we're doing now where it's like I'll hear about these like a super obscure fairy tales I've never heard of because of some <laughs> some indie author retelling. Yeah, yeah, they can be really cool. I think it's that's something that we do in every generation is retell them, and the ones that stand the test of time endure. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to ask you about the uh, what's your writing process like? I mean, you you seem like a, a relatively fast <laughs> writer focused and then you like take a break for a while or something like what is your writing process um, like it's chaotic i would say i kind of uh i don't know i kind of i'm a very much like a type a personality like very annoyingly like i want to you know i have to do this every day or i'm a total failure so sometimes i'm a little bit like i'll get burnt out because um it's hard like time time wise i think that i'm hoping that i'll be able to maintain my pace a little better actually for this book because when i was um now my daughter is sleeping at night so i've been getting up early every day like 4 30 in the morning okay. um and i like that i like to be up and like before that when i wrote my last book i would get up when the kids get up because she'd be in my bed all night you know awake all night she's really little yeah. um so yeah so my actual process now i think that i just i'm, I'm very I want to be that person who just does the fast drafts. Like I always like anytime you read the independent, you know, the indie author business stuff or anything, people are like, Oh yeah, just write the draft and you can edit it. Like I tried to do that for years. And those were the books that I hated mm -hmm. and just was like, nah, moving on to the next book. Because for me, I don't enjoy the editing process very much. And I find that having to okay. do all of that work, at once and just be faced with this manuscript that's a mess I find that extremely stressful so I actually totally break the rule and I do a lot of editing as I go um not down mm -hmm. to like the crazy level like I'll be like oh that sentence is kind of stupid moving on you know because you, you know you can't I think that's another mistake you'll make you write you know it does you no good to write the same first five chapters of your novel indefinitely like at some point you just have to finish mm -hmm. projects and that's how you start right. um but for me yeah I'd say my process now um very basic. So I guess like drafting and editing, of course, are kind of different things. But yeah, right now, uh, for the past while, since my books come out, I've been doing plotting. So uh, similar process, I'm still writing a lot down, but there's a lot of like sitting there, like drinking coffee, thinking about stuff. Um, and yeah, I just I get up really early in the morning. And that's my biggest tip for anyone busy. Like I homeschool my six year old, I have a one year old, it's busy you know it's busy being a mom and trying to do stuff and having this is like shockingly quiet right now by the way like the chances of me having this much time to myself any day it's like this is a gift from the lord like i don't think most, this never happens um yeah so I, I get up and i just yeah my process really i just start i have a good outline that's really important to me now now that i've realized okay i'm gonna probably edit as i go so i may as well have this figured out then i sit down and i just mm -hmm. yeah i write every day 
I really don't like skipping days at all. We were sick the past few days and I had to take a few days off and it was like stressful and I felt like really guilty. (laughs) And then, yeah, do that. And then editing, I just go back through and I, I take, I do take some editing notes. Like I, I don't go back and re edit major things. Like if there's something like I need to add a character's a mention of a character earlier in the book, I'll, I have like a little tab on my Scrivener that's just like editing notes and I'll write that in and be like, go back to chapter five and add this. Those things I leave where they are, mm-hmm. keep moving forward in the draft. Um, nice. So I first thing I go through all those things, <laughs> I find all those like major things that are usually bigger problems then I find other problems as I'm reading and I fix those. And then, yeah, I just keep, yeah. I don't know if you want to go too far into editing stuff, but that's, yeah, that's my process. Very simple. Lots of editing, lots of like editing as I go writing pretty clean first drafts. Yeah. I think that's, <laughs> that covers it. <laughs> I do that too. Very much like that. Very much like that. How, um, uh, you actually had mentioned, um, uh, um, what was it? Bible parables and so on. And I, you mentioned that you're a Catholic convert. Yeah. Can I ask about, part of a uh, part of that journey. Cause one of the things that's uh, intriguing, you know, to what we're trying to do with Catholic author is uh, how to write, you know, faith inspired fiction that the people really want to read that doesn't end up becoming preachy. Yeah, hard. And I Rough. like how you decided to be more subtle, you know, let's just lean more onto the fantasy side versus the more Christian fantasy or something. Uh, but first, so before getting into that, I'm curious to hear more about your conversion story. You said you walked away from everything for a while. Yeah, it's it's been a wild few years. Um so I grew up trying to like condense this. Like I've I've talked about my conversion story in like podcasts where it's like it's a whole own thing. So I'll keep it brief. But uh, I was basically I was baptized and raised um Greek Orthodox. So I did have a Christian background. Um my father mm-hmm. is still very much he's Greek Orthodox. He's still very serious about his faith. My mom and sisters don't really practice anything. Um, and I kind of left Christianity in general when I was a teenager, I would say late teens, and then kind of just floundered around for several years. Um, and I was about, how old was I? Maybe like 25. I started kind of having more questions and I started just, Mm -hmm. yeah, I I was exploring all kinds of stuff. I really started exploring Judaism and that really fascinated me. And then I think that that partly really helped me when I became Catholic because I was like, wow, there's so many things that the Catholic church specifically fulfills about about Judaism that it makes sense. You know, it, 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 it's just very clear that this is a continuous, it's a continuous religion, right? Like it's not like a new religion that we just made up at Pentecost, right? It's, it's a continuation of God's people. Um, yeah. yeah so I started, I've had quite a crazy conversion story. I don't want to get too far into it, but, um, it was kind of, it was in 2018 and that's when I came back to the church. I had originally kind of thought maybe I'll go back to the Orthodox church and, It didn't work out that way. Um, And I, for me, it was really just learning about the papacy. That's what kind of convinced me. And I kind of, because I was, you know, because I wasn't coming from a Protestant background, even though I was kind of lapsed, I never really, I didn't have to like unlearn some of these very, these other core beliefs. So for me, it was like, I already Mm. believe in the basic thesis of scripture and tradition and that kind of thing. And it was kind of, which, where is the authority of Christ? So, you know, for me, once I started researching Mm -hmm. the papacy, which I'd kind of heard a lot of the like kind of pop apologetics from orthodox people about growing up that i didn't really i never really dug into it too far you know it wasn't really something you consider when you're 12 right right? (laughs) um and i well most people um and yeah i I kind of just came back to the catholic church and it's been it's been wonderful i can't believe i've been yeah my son was baptized and he was two we came back and then i later i met my husband and he's also a catholic convert and now we have a daughter and you know we got married and now we're just raising a little dorky little catholic family and it's uh it's been beautiful it's been (laughs) absolutely wonderful to do and then i was writing doing a lot of writing in catholic media space that's kind of what i've taken a break from for the last couple of years because i was getting really again really burnt out but it was more burnout from the social media side than the writing per se so yeah and i kind of yeah and i i just i didn't write fiction for a couple of years and it's just it's something i've always wanted to do like since i was a little kid and i just kept coming you know just kept realizing like i am not going to be content (laughs) with myself until i do this so i did it i guess Mm -hmm. (laughs) i had to do it well congrats that's that's amazing good for you and how do you um when it comes to avoiding like being preachy and writing fiction and stuff, how did you wrestle with I'm that? I'm still wrestling or, with that. It's, um, <laughs> yeah. this is a hard, it's a hard one, you know, and especially since a lot of the people that I've been able to kind of market to, and especially initially, and a lot of the connections I've made have been from a lot of other Christian backgrounds that where 
I'd mm-hmm. say Christian fiction is more popular. You know, some of these other groups, I mean, there's like this publishing company that I really love called Enclave uh, Publishing. They're a Protestant uh, speculative mm-hmm. fiction publisher. They have all kinds of great books. I highly recommend them, honestly. I mean, some of the stuff you might have some doctrinal series, but a lot of it is, again, it's just, it's not preachy. It's just, you can tell mm-hmm. like that, especially when you kind of know what to look for. If you're already a Christian, you can tell where the author's coming from. So, so I've been in this kind of mm-hmm. space where I'm like, you know, I'm certainly not going to break, you know, you really can't brand yourself as a strictly Catholic author because I would say Catholics are even less likely than Protestants to seek out, like, you know, they're not on Amazon searching like Catholic books for teens. It's just, it's, I would say even culturally as Catholics, I think that because we have such a long, long, long history, <laughs> you know, we just kind of assume like, oh yeah, those classics are written by Catholics. You know, <laughs> like we just, it's our literary thing. I think that it's, it's kind of more of a Protestant thing to have started being like, okay, how can we write specifically Christian books? And, and I don't mean that as right. insulting at all. Just yeah. I don't mean tribe. that as insulting. Cause I think yeah. that again, I, I enjoy a lot of these books. There's a lot of these authors that I think write fantastic stuff and I just completely mm-hmm. support them. I'm just not sure it because it's hard, right? Because like you said, because you're you you either have to decide like, am I writing only for Christians or am I writing from a perspective of a Christian? Am I writing things that teach right. the gospel? It's it's you know, this I've gone back and forth in since the release of Magnify, I've gone back and forth on this. Because the original blurb for the book just said a Christian epic fantasy series. And I think it is, because I know someone out there, now that I've changed it to just kind of be more just posing it as just a young adult epic fantasy series which again it also is i'm terrified that i'm going to get that one star mm-hmm. review that's like this mentions someone that's clearly god you know like some atheist is going to hate it but that's the risk you take and no one likes everything and i ultimately didn't want to cut myself mm-hmm. off from people that would like the book that may not be specifically mm-hmm. again looking for it in that way so i still nice. don't know the answer to, <laughs> to your question because it's, it's like i think i'm going to keep going back and forth because part of it too is i think that a lot of just a side point i think a lot of christian creators there's this mentality that like if you want at all to have any sort of success career longevity make money it's like a sin or something right and i'm like well you're never gonna have good christian stuff if people aren't allowed to like try and make a mo- make money you know i i I, you know, I'm not, I, there's a reason besides the moral reason that I'm not writing like, you know, romance, the billionaire, like, you know, stuff or whatever, um, just to make money on Kindle mm-hmm. Unlimited, because, you know, I, I don't want to do that. I want to write things that I, that I care about and that I in, I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't, it doesn't mean then that therefore I should just do work, you know, do these like 10, hundreds of hours of work just for free, you know, because, you, and I think there's that still that yeah. mindset is really strong. I would say among most, like a lot of Christians that I talk to that like, wait, you're writing a book and you're trying to market it outside of just Christians. Like you're not going to like literally put the Bible in this story. It's like, well, no, it doesn't fit this story. You know, like I, yeah, you have to deal with the st- Like I'm more focused on what makes sense of the story. Like I, you want to stay consistent with your world. And sometimes, sometimes that happens. There's a, a, again, another Protestant author. There's a series I love called the blades of Actar by Trisha Mingerink. Um, okay. It's a bit, I, I commented a couple of my views. I'm like, this is a little bit Calvinist, but like overall it's really enjoyable. And I don't know if she called it a fantasy because it's, it's like set in another world, but there's Jesus and the Bible. And it's like, but it's so, I love this. I love the series. Like people are getting persecuted. People are getting like executed by the state for their belief. It's awesome. Like I, I really liked it. Like I liked it, but that's not what my book was. And I'm not going to just like, how do I artificially make this more Catholic to, uh, you know, to do, to do, you know, to not be sinning or whatever. I just think that's, yeah, sorry. That's like a really long monologue. I have lots of thoughts on the Christmas No, that's fiction. fine. Cause there's such, there's such artificial yep. constraints really. Um, we, we take a big cue from what our friends do it over at Chrism Press where they're like, we're writing faith inspired fiction. And I think the way you said it was a good one. This is like fiction coming from a Christian perspective, how Christians maybe see the world through sacramental eyes, you know, um, but we don't have to name drop maybe like, like C.S. Lewis does. And, and not all of us are going to be as immersive, uh, mind blowing as Tolkien. <laughs> yeah, obviously. but there's that sort of happy middle ground where it's got to be an it's got to be a good story with with believable characters, you know, but not evangelistic. That's not at least with our community, like what you're saying. That's kind of not the point to well to evangelize and provide apologetics and sort of inject the Bible into things. It's like we're going to tell a good story. And then how that fits, yeah. The way the characters work through things 
are an expression of how we think about yeah the absolutely world. i think you know i would say that the evangelism to thing too i think it depends on what you mean by you know whether it's something's evangelistic right because i would say in a broad sense hopefully everything you do in your life as a christian is evangelism right you're su- yeah exactly you're supposed to be you're supposed yeah. to be a, a witness and i think that like there's also a time when you know you have to ask like am i writing something that's against the gospel that's against my faith because like, that's a very different question like i wouldn't support that I'm not it's not right. saying characters can't do bad things my characters do plenty of bad things but that i'm not going to glorify that like i'm not going to write a book where i'm like cool they're doing all these like horrible sins and it's cool to do like no i'm not i'm not going to put that in my books and you don't have to do that like brandon mm-hmm. sanderson is a mormon author and like if you read his books they're very they are first awesome. he's a fantastic writer yeah. second they're they're clean <laughs> Like they're not, you're not going to find like pornographic stuff happening. It's, but it's not like, it doesn't feel like dorky or like he's just trying to avoid real life, right? Like, and I think that that in and of itself is evangelism in a way, right? Because it's showing, because I think that that's, that's where the whole culture warrior element is. It's, it's interesting. Like it's different. It's, it's interesting to think about like how that all kind of shakes out because I think ultimately everything is <laughs> part of that because everything is, it's, it's God or Satan right? on some level. And I think a lot of the stuff in media is Satan. Like I think a lot of the, but it's subtle. It's not all that. It's not that all secular books are like going out there saying, Oh, you know, do evil things. There's plenty of secular books that are, you know, teach. I've like benefited so much from like, I don't read strictly Christian fiction by a long shot. There's all kinds of great stuff. But I do Mm -hmm. think that more and more and more, especially in young adult, that's another reason, like a very side reason, aside from my general enjoyment of writing for teenagers, um, I think a lot of young Mm -hmm. adult fiction now, I am absolutely shocked by what's in it. Like it used to be, you know, if you're an adult and you wanted to read stuff that wasn't going to like act, be like, oh, okay, there's a sex scene. You know, like you could just go to like the young adult section and just pick up a book, right? And they'd all be relatively okay. Now that's not Mm -hmm. the case at all. Now they're like selling stuff that's just completely like, so I'm just kind of like, how can I write a book that, you know, maybe that's like a, a kind of side selling point, right? That people who like Brandon Sanderson are like, oh yeah, this book's, this book's really cool too. Like I know the content mm-hmm. isn't going to put my conscience in a bad place where I'm thinking like, should I be reading this? And that, that in and of itself is, it's that in and of itself is evangelistic in a way because it's showing this is what's good and true and beautiful. And that, that's what I think I want to get across good and true and beautiful more than strictly yeah, Jesus and the Bible. And again, depending on the story, I, I can't say I'll never include a story that has more explicit stuff, but I'm just not sure it fits in my completely fictional fantasy <laughs> fantasy world. Yeah, 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 with the world that you're building. Yeah, I think kind of like what you're saying that being Catholic, Christian, Orthodox, whatever, it really should push us to understand the, the, the nature of what we're doing, to understand the craft, to understand what writing is is what a story is what function it's like meant to serve for the human spirit psyche you know and um i see people who don't you know it's kind of like if you're building a cathedral or you're building a car the prime focus is what it's got to work otherwise nobody's going to use it and it's the same thing with the story it's got you it's going to force you to focus on your craft otherwise what ends up happening is you're basically weaponizing your thing object craft for an idea that you have and i say weaponized loosely i mean you can also use you know you can tell a parable but not everybody wants to hear parables some people really want to read fantasy fiction and so it's like well what would you do where would your imagination go with that and i think that's that's the important thing um as we start to wrap up i want to ask you about uh marketing (laughs) And you did this fun post about Bookstagram versus behind oh. the scenes. And it was funny to see all that. <laughs> oh, Your thank photos you. are awesome. Thank you. Like you take great photos. Can we talk about that? How are you, how are you doing that? I mean, you went, you self-published. Did you hire an editor? How did you make the cover? Uh, what is your marketing plan like? Can oh, you give us yeah. A peek so under this stuff there? is actually a lot of authors hate marketing. I hear that all the time from people. To me, I'm really interested in the business side of it because to me, it's like it's like owning my own little old business that I can work on at home with my crazy life. Mm-hmm. And I, I really enjoy that part of it. Um, I've learned I've spent like hundreds of hours listening to podcasts and learning and going on like Facebook groups for indie authors. And it's been super awesome. And I'm still learning. There's still mistakes I've made. Like, for example, not being ready in time. And I just this morning got the finalized art for my uh, paperback and hardcover. So those books that I was hoping would be ready in physical copies a month ago are finally going to be ready because I didn't leave myself enough time. But you, 
it's really interesting to just like see what I'll do differently. But yeah, my overall thing, um, as for editors, I, I feel like this is like, shocking to tell people because I'm like embarrassed to say it, but I did not hire an editor and I probably won't for book two. Um, because I, I'm really, I understand why editors are great to have. And if I was making money from my book at this point in time, I would be more inclined to do it because it also cuts down your process and your time, right? If you can just send it to an editor versus having to like do the rigorous stuff on your own by yourself, right? That, that does help. But for me, I personally decided against it. However, I wouldn't recommend that for a lot of people. The reason I think I was able, so far, nobody has complained about the editing of my book. Um, not that I've had a, like, a mountain of readers yet, but so far, I'm pretty confident. For me, my, my husband is the pickiest person on planet Earth. Like, he'll be reading like a Stephen King novel and be like, ah, typo. Like, he's crazy. He finds everything. Everything. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, if he can read this and find all the nitpicky things or some of the stuff he was saying, I'm like, you're dumb. I'm leaving that. <laughs> like, I'm not changing that. You're being ridiculous. But, you know, I was like, if I can pass his standards, it's probably okay. Um, but I do have a bit of a background because, I, like I said, I did work in the kind of Catholic – Catholic media world. I was writing articles and I worked with editors at some of the publications I was writing for. So I have a little more experience maybe in actually in professional, semi-professional writing where I was getting paid to, to write. So if you don't have that, right. like get an editor, <laughs> but if you, yeah. Well, you've got, you've yeah, got exactly. beta readers. So you had at least one there. So that's yeah, and that's still, important. you should still do that because it helps yeah. you to get like from a reader's perspective. I had a good, a good, a good Catholic friend of mine. Um, yeah. Jacinta Boudreaux, who actually, she put out a book recently about Catholic modesty that's very, very good and really like gets into stuff like the historical church teaching and all the modern documents. Very interesting book. Um, but she was such a big help. Like, she found all kinds of stuff that I was reading. Like, why did I write that? That's so bad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I did, I did a lot of that. And then for the cover, absolutely did not do that myself. Um, I was able to work with a really really like well-priced, fantastic cover design company called Etheric Designs. And they're on Facebook. And I like really recommend them to anybody who's doing like a book in kind of my vein where it's <laughs> like fantasy or that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. I came up with the concept. I, I sent uh, my designer this hideous, <laughs> absolutely hideous, like scratchy pencil drawing. It was basically like my cover has like a shield and then like two cross swords. And I, I kind of, I just put the shield and I had this, there's this other fantasy novel that I liked that had the shield. And I was like, I want something like this where it kind of looks like a portal. Can you do that? And I just scrawled like a dragon. And like, she thought one of them was a bird. It was horrible. My art skills are terrible, but she, yeah, I would say for me, I think this is again, gets into the thing where I think a lot of Christians think that it's like somehow wrong to say this part of it was a business decision. And I think a good cover is more important than perfect editing. Um, I know that might be an unpopular opinion. Uh, there's this YouTube ad that I get all the time. That's like, you know why some, you know, most self-published authors never sell more than a few copies. It's because they didn't get their book edited. And I'm like, in my head, every time I hear it, I'm like, no, it's because their, their covers are terrible. Like really, you're never, your readers are not going <laughs> to complain about your editing if they never look at your book because you did it yourself and you're not, and if you're good, if you're artistic and good at it, go ahead, but I'm terrible. So I was like, absolutely not. I can edit myself. I absolutely cannot do covers. Um, yeah, so I I will say my my marketing strategy though is it's more about a long-term strategy than a short-term strategy because I'm not stressed at all about my sales or anything mm -hmm. for this book because a big thing with the in specifically yeah. with independent publishing this would be different if you're going through a traditional publisher but for independent publishing it's the best thing you could do is just write the next book, especially in a series, because a lot of people say that, that they're like, I put all this time and effort and money into marketing my book one, and they just never took off at all. And I could have been writing three more books in the amount of effort and money. And so for me, I'm just like, you know what, it's out yeah. there. Readers seem to enjoy it so far. And I'm very thankful to everyone mm -hmm. who has been reading this. I, I saw people reading it now. They're like, I'm going to do a review. I'm, I'm coming, you know. Um, but yeah, I've just been kind of doing myself myself. Established a newsletter. Very important. Get your own newsletter. I did a website. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy like tinkering with websites. So I had to like force myself not to waste too much, <laughs> too much time on that part. Yeah, and then I just have a Facebook page, which yep. has like 30 people liking it. I don't really use Facebook. Um, but uh, again, you want to be, mm -hmm. you have to pick the core places that your readers will be. Like I want somebody, if they are, if they are a Facebook person, I want them to like go be able to like my page. Even if it's not my thing, I still try and post there every day or two, just something, you know, just to have it there. And my Instagram though mm -hmm. is so much fun. And that's where I connected with you guys. And Instagram is just like, 
it's like, I think it's a it's a good platform for writers. Funny enough, considering it's all pictures, I don't like the reels thing. Like I'm not good at <laughs> not good at the reels, but gotta get that out. Uh, I can't gotta, crack them. I'm terrible. You gotta do but, the reels. You gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's a bunch. Oh, that's fun. Do you have plans? Do you have plans to include um, or to kind of involve your readers as you're working on the next novel instead of uh, like some authors will like give me a cabin in the woods and <laughs> zero human contact spaceship is even better um or do you i don't know like have you thought about including uh readers to um, get more regular feedback through it yeah i do think that's a like very good involved? idea i'm not sure how much i would do it with this book too mostly because i just don't have a lot of readers yet and i think that some of the people i've connected most closely with so far in my brief kind of new career here is that it's a lot of those people aren't really in my genre that I tend to know well. So, you know, cause I don't, you know, you need to get advice from people and you, you want readers who really read your kind of book because they're the ones who are going to know what other readers who read your kind of book like. And so I think that's why I've been a little more like, you know, goblin in my own little cave writing um, with this book. But I do think it's really important and a good idea. And I'm totally want to think of ways to kind of, you know, I, I talk about my process a lot. Like I do share, like I'll be like taking like a Instagram story in the morning when I'm like nice. sitting here at 5 a.m. by myself. Like, hey guys, I just had a good plotting session. You guys are going to fall in love. There's romance happening in this next thing. Like I do talk about stuff and try and like get people thinking. But yeah, it's That's it's awesome. hard when you don't have a ton of <laughs> big audience yet to be like, Paul, what should I name this guy? But yeah, those kind of things as a reader, I do find really fun. So yeah, I'll have to think about that for book three. <laughs> Well, that's cool. Well, we have to start, we have to wrap up. So I want to ask you in a minute, uh, your, well, a one minute piece of advice to oh, authors everywhere. It's always my favorite part. Uh, before we get to that in a second, if you, uh, dear viewer, listener, if you enjoyed this, please go ahead and uh, if you're on, if you're on YouTube anyway, hit that like button. It does help more people to hear more about Stephanie, learn more about her book. Um, this, this interview and the kind of conversations we're having here, it's a like a preview of the community we are building in Catholic Author. It's a super friendly, creative community for the modern Catholic author. It's a place to give and get feedback, uh, share your insights, your works in progress, and build a network of supportive friends. So, And there's a whole lot more, like a lot more. Come and check us out and uh, join us at catholicauthor.us. All right, Stephanie, last question for you. If you had one minute to share a, a word of encouragement to other Catholic writers, well, faith inspired writers. Um, what would you say? Well, I would say them? that my biggest thing that I would, I guess, is more of advice than encouragement, but I encourage people to keep going. Even if you feel like you've been wanting to be a writer for years and years, it's not too late. You can totally do it. Um, I would say to try your best to finish things. Um, it's better to have a couple of like books and just call them a practice book, take the pressure off, than to tinker around with the first four chapters for the next five years of your life. Um, another thing would be writing faster is actually easier because you don't forget everything. <laughs> and when you, when you write really slow, you forget things, but, uh, yeah. And I would say write every day. Those are, that is all that, those are the only things I had to do to kind of get me over the finish line. I think if I keep doing those things, write fast, finish things, write every day, you know, you are going to be a totally different writer in even like three years. If you do that, you're going to have like 10 books out and you're going to be awesome. 